David Rothenberg brings a whole new dimension to our relationship to other species, and that is he's finding music in the world that isn't made by people, that's made by all kinds of creatures, and even has some thoughts that we may have gotten our musical, our musicality from insects. So his books, Bug Music and Survival of the Beautiful, are available on the book table. He is a professor at the New Jersey Institute of Technology, comes to us fresh from having spoken at the Arboretum yesterday, and we're very fortunate to have him. Hi, everybody. Hi. Good to see you on Sunday morning. I know you've had all kinds of organisms introduced to you by different people. I guess everyone's in charge of one level of life, the vast sense of biodiversity. And uh, the whole title of the conference is, is uh, listening to the voices of nature. So at least someone should talk about the music of nature. And so that's why I'm so happy to be here and talk about bug music and how insects taught us everything about music. Everything we ever wanted to know came from bugs. And we'll see if that's really true. And I spent um, many years trying to make music with all kinds of creatures. I, I think I started with birds. I think even before that, I started being influenced by Elizabeth Marshall Thomas. I'm so happy to see that she's here. Because when I was a grad student in philosophy, she said, you shouldn't study philosophy. It's just a bunch of, a bunch of men thinking they know everything. And they don't do anything. They don't go out and pay attention to the world. And, you know, I, I was always a musician. I thought I should really do that, go out and play along with nature. And so I started playing with birds maybe 20 years ago. So this is a white-crested laughing thrush at the National Aviary in Pittsburgh. This is the one bird in the whole aviary that got excited when I tried to play. And later I learned why. See, this is one of those bird species where the males and females both sing with each other and they sing complex duets and this guy was all alone for who knows how many years. And suddenly, suddenly, yeah. <laughs> So this is a pretty common bird in, in Southeast Asia, and, and the, the way they musically interact with, with each other is quite fascinating, and yet there's only two scientific papers ever written on this phenomenon. You know, and this bird is as common as blue jays are here. No one bothers to study this. You could only figure out how interesting it is by trying to play along with them musically interact. And I've done the same with humpback whales. This is a little more difficult. You need all this equipment. You have an underwater speaker and microphone, and you're playing, uh, you're sitting uh, on a boat and, and trying to interact with the whales. And this takes a lot of effort to make it happen. <laughs> Humpback whales, as you all probably know, this crowd, they, they change their songs from year to year. So they, they will change what they're doing sometimes when they hear clarinets and respond. And, and that's pretty interesting. And again, we have no idea why they're doing this. But that's a whole other talk, which I gave yesterday. But today we're going to hear about bugs playing with insects. The idea of making music with insects has many other challenges, as you can see here. Mm-hmm. 
<laughs> yeah, Adam saw this video. This thing, he didn't want to invite me when he saw it. But you, and, and the problem is, there's just as many 17 year cicadas inside my shirt as outside. <laughs> Of course, many people would think it's kind of ridiculous. This is just a bunch of crazy insects making noise. And, uh, and yet, we've always loved the sounds of insects and thought they were kind of something musical about them. Here's a painting by the American artist Charles Birchfield from the 1940s called The Insect Chorus, in which he also came along with a specific index of each species of bug that, that he's referring to on these different uh, parts of the image. And he uh, specifically wanted to illustrate what's beautiful and, and artistic and patterned about these sounds around us that he was hearing outside his house in Buffalo on a, on a warm August afternoon. And in fact, the sounds of insects you know, are millions of years older than anything human beings could do because they were around long before us. And they have these aspects of music that are so important to human beings. Rhythm, repetition, pattern, and, and kind of, you know, cycles that grab our attention. Similar to the rhythms of fireflies, you can, um, we see these patterns, every individual one doesn't know so much about what's going on, but together they can form this musical whole. So the music of insects is individuals together making something only the many can produce. And they don't have to know so much about what each one does to make something interesting. And some of this is one of the few aspects of uh, kind of musical communication in animals that, that people have figured out. For example, this is the analysis of the phase delay mechanism that allows crickets to synchronize with each other without having to think too much. So if a, a cricket is going, say a snowy tree cricket, which is about this big, they're pretty common, but you won't see them too often because they hide out in the tops of trees. But you've heard them, they go kind of And when they hear another one, they just try and get a little closer to it. All they do is they hear a second one, and they try and move a little bit closer to it. So if you hear something like this, which should sound a little familiar, that could be one or it could be like 20 of them, all synchronized. Anyway, I decided to turn that idea into a piece of music, which I'm going to play along with you. We take one snowy tree cricket sound and then move in and out and change the pitch of it and kind of follow this rule of, of synchronization and see what becomes of that.
so this uh, world of insect sounds, you know, totally can musically inspire people to, to uh, and you don't have to technologically mess with them the way I did there. You can find around the world there's people, whole cultures that live and musically live completely in the midst of the sounds of the insects and other creatures around them. This is a, is a sonogram, a kind of printout of frequency against time, the kind that scientists use to analyze uh, all kinds of sounds that can be hard to explain. And it's a recording of the Bayaka in the Central African Republic, pygmies, women out gathering food, gathering mushrooms, singing along with all these kinds of insects and frogs that live in their environment. And you can see right here that uh, the sounds of humans have their own space and the acoustic niche of, of, of possible sounds. And every creature is kind of exactly in its place and in a really organized way. So rather than just being a wash of noise, it all kind of makes sense. So the visual representation helps show the whole uh, sense of each sound being in its place. We can see the organization that can be very hard to hear. And this is among the many recordings made by Louis Sarno, a guy from New Jersey who lived 35 years with the pygmies just because like, he loved their music. He wasn't really an anthropologist or musicologist. He just liked living there. and he, he uh, recorded 1,500 hours of their music and donated all to Oxford University, to the Pitt Rivers Museum. And there's a film about him called Song from the Forest that came out recently. And you can hear what it's like to be a six foot tall New Jersey pygmy with all these sounds. And <laughs> so even single sounds of insects can be revealed more clearly as being musical by looking at them, printing them out. And this is one syllable of one cicada. And cicadas vibrate their abdomen shh, to make this sound, not their wings. But you can see just a lot is going on. When you hear it, it might sound just like noise. Oops, that just stops. So again, you know, it might not be a sound everyone likes, but I think if the, the image shows that it's really something very much shaped with a beginning, a middle, and an end, and it's incredibly beautiful. The layers of frequencies, little bits of tones mixed with noise that, that the sonogram image can reveal. And it's like a simple sense of a musical utterance, a song, most human languages talk about these insect sounds as songs because we've known there's something similar to music about this sound. These cicadas are singing to announce their presence, attract a mate, defend their, not really defend their territory the way birds do, but kind of announce their presence. And they're doing it with this repetitive sound that's shaped and formed and has perhaps a kind of emotional content. Okay. Uh, Skip this. Okay, so here um, I'm very interested in what it means to be humans making music with different insects. I brought my friend Timothy Hill, who's an overtone singer, so he can sing various pitches all together, like and sing whole harmonies out in a whole field full of many different insects. And we have our own kind of vision of the organized soundscape of bugs. <laughs> So 
be singing this tone and overtones and these different crickets are at a high and a different frequency range. Among the world of insects, there's so many strange acoustic phenomena that, that people are just beginning to find out. Leaf hoppers and tree hoppers that live on the stalks of trees, they vibrate the stems and make this incredibly complex sounds that, um, that really are astonishing when you hear them. They, they, they're vibrations. They get, they get to be turned into sound by, by either when it was first discovered, a phonograph cartridge or now something called a laser vibrometer measures the vibrations and can turn into sound. So you have this strange electronic sounds, basically, made by, you know, creatures this big. These are, this is a whole medley of different species, so. <laughs> so. I played these sounds for E.O. Wilson right in this room, and he was totally amazed. He had no idea this stuff was going on. <laughs> uh, Probably the most famous strange insect sound, the lesser water boatman, an insect about this big, discovered just maybe 10 years ago um, by a scientist named James Windmill, discovered, they, they thought their equipment was malfunctioning. They, they put these hydrophones in ponds and they heard these incredibly loud noises and, and um, this one's better, that, that uh, you know, they thought there must be a motorboat in the pond. It was so loud. It was like almost 80, 90 decibels, almost as loud as a whale. And it turns out this bug is vibrating its penis really quickly underwater and it's loud as a whale. And uh, although it's generally believed the bigger animal makes more noise, you have a chart how big it is, how much noise it can make. This thing is like an outlier. It's just like, you know, I wouldn't try this at home. It's not, a, but it's definitely, the weird things are out there and there's so much more we don't know. We, of course, have the famous pine, mountain, pine, mountain pine bark beetle that's devastating trees in the west. They make these sinister sounds inside the barks of trees. Yeah. And these things are devastating the forests of the American West, just cutting through the bark and stripping it. This is how much it died, you know, this species because of climate change. Oops, changing the, the temperature and so they, they've spread places they're not supposed to be and huge uh, destruction of forests. And one uh, actually composer, David Dunn, together with a physicist in Arizona, proposed that if we could broadcast sounds into the inside of trees, maybe we could convince the beetles to, um, you know, change their behavior. And uh, that's pretty hard to do, but they've tried it and they've, they've had the beetles start to eat each other instead of the the, the the bark, but you know, it's a, it's a lot of work to broadcast sound into hundreds of millions of trees. It's kind of a strange thing to do. But we must really get back to cicadas here because the 17-year the cicada is so fascinating to look at in terms of sound because there's so many of them when they appear. And when you first hear it, it just kind of sounds like a wash of noise. But it turns out that um, well, they're very easy to study compared to a lot of other insects because there's so many around when they come out. And it turns out there's three different species. Each makes more than four different sounds. There can be 12 specific sounds going on right now that you can learn to hear and understand the ecological insect sound world of these guys. They don't quite make it as far east as here, but, you know, th these things were named Magis cicada in the 18... 20s already because they knew there was something really magical about this insect that somehow knew to come out every 17 years. Every year they come out somewhere in case you want to find them. This is a cicada map. So 2019, if you head to Iowa uh, and Illinois, they're going to come out. And they came out around here in 2013 
and then 2012 down here, 2011 in this area. So they're always coming out somewhere. This is the brood two cicadas of 2013. Uh, John Cooley at the University of Connecticut is the world expert on this phenomenon. He travels around with his specially, special cicada car logging where he hears them. And at least this is what he did before. Now there's an app. Anyone can do it. Just take your phone and track the cicadas. You don't need this keyboard and all this equipment. That is so cool. The cicada, cicada logging devices. But he's done a lot to show that you know, even to lure people in, or anyone can be part of the cicada data collection. Why do they come out every 17 years? Actually, we have no idea. Uh, it used to be believed that the 17-year prime number cycle might um, be a different cycle than regular predators that might eat these things and might have six-year cycles. That's what Stephen Jay Gould, who had an office upstairs, proposed. But there aren't really any predators like that these things. The way they survive predation is just being it's so numerous. No matter how many are eaten, there's more. But a theory was put forth by some Japanese scientist, uh, uh, Yumi Tanaka. He, he said, look, you know, the only way you can get, one way you can get these prime number cycles is um, the species competing against itself. Theoretically, this whole idea is, now there's no evidence of this, but imagine there was uneven glaciation and the only place these insects could live is one spot. There'd be like so many of them that would mates, you know, that, that, that would go underground and live and come up. They would compete against each other and in this mathematical model. Let's see when they come up. The prime numbers kind of win out if a species competes against itself. But this, we don't know if this really happened. It doesn't happen anywhere else. In the, in the world except the eastern United States, where there was this kind of uneven glaciation at a certain point just a few thousand years ago. The, how, people ask how long do 17-year cicadas live? Of course, they live 17 years. And they're the longest living insect that we know about. They're alive underground waiting to come out. How do they know when to come out? Somehow they count the changes in temperature. And, and they, they, after 17, they come up. They often make mistakes. You know, There's always a few that come out the wrong year, say. Where's the party? <laughs> I don't see anyone else. <laughs> and, uh, and then when they're up, they, they're just alive a few weeks when they can sing, fly, mate, and die. And that's when we come across them. And uh, the single sound, <laughs> called the pharaoh sound, the most common sound, pharaoh, magic cicada septum decim, when you hear millions of them together, it merges into this sort of natural drone. We're going to hear that right now. The tail of it disappears, and you just hear, they're kind of all in one. So for years, it was uh, thought that um, it was thought that the males just sang and the females find, found them, and that was it. Like most insects, when it, when the males have a song, but John Cooley thought it has to be more complicated. There's too many cicadas here. There's too many overlapping species. There must be something else going on. And just in the 1990s, through sheer observation, he and his colleague John you know, David Marshall, they re learned that the by just by listening and watching, going out there and looking, no special equipment, that the females were also making a sound with their wings. And then they discovered this complex mating ritual. Here is John Cooley snapping his finger at just the right time to attract a male cicada. And he discovered this very complicated mating ritual, more complicated than any other insect in terms of sound. So, so the males do this. Then they keep doing it. No, nothing happens. If they hear the female do this, then they do it again, just to make sure it's really happening. And then if they hear another one, they go on to this call type here. And then the females make another one. And then only then do they actually start mating and make this sound. So these are some of the sounds you hear if you go out and listen to cicadas. And the most fascinating thing is that these guys just looked and listened. And it was always there. Anyone could have heard or seen this, but no one bothered to pay that close attention to the cicada phenomenon. They just thought it was a lot of bugs making one sound. Uh, John, I mean, John Cooley is very good at convincing cicadas to mate with the light switch. He just flicks it. He says the timing has to be exact number of milliseconds, and the cicadas will try and mate with the sound. You know, nobody else is as good as he is at doing this. He's spent so many years. 
there they are, you know. So next year you can go find them, go to the Midwest. I spent a lot of time playing music with them, um, and you might think it's ridiculous, but uh, it's actually kind of fun. <laughs> like participating in this world of um, millions of creatures. You're just one more creature in the mix of it. Start to hear this tone in your dreams, the tone hard to place in between C and C sharp. They also like electronic sounds. You know, you can. They, they love the sound iPads can make strange instruments, and maybe the iPad was invented to play music with cicadas. And although it's probably most fun to play in the wild with these creatures, they're pretty cooperative if you bring them into the concert situation. When you put them on the microphone, and we played this concert, which I will recreate for you now. This is at the uh, University of Illinois, or Champaign, you know. This is when they're just settling down, and then once they get there, they'll start to scream. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, no cicadas were harmed in this uh, process. We all brought them back to that same spot where they were covering all over. And you know, I, each of these projects with birds and whales and bugs, I've written books about the, the whole mixture of the science and music of relating to nature. They all had CDs that go came with them. Bug music, book and CD. Somebody made t-shirts about the philosophy of the cicada, a guy in Tennessee, sing, fly, mate, die. But it's not just a new idea to celebrate this thing. Yeah, yeah, we have like two minutes to go. So I'm done. And then, uh, you know, in, Ch in China and Japan, there's literally thousands of poems. It's about the song and sound of, of cicadas. Cicadas sing, know not how soon they all will die. <laughs> Basho. And uh, some hear bug music, some hear people music. All depends on your ears. I think this is like, you know. 
they knew that, that, that this is music out there and we all are part of this natural world trying to find our place and we all need the sense of sound and its presence, its repetition and innovation to make sense of, you know, how to feel part of the rhythms and direction of this world. And um, so think about that next time you, you hear an insect. At this time of year, there's literally also thousands of poems about crickets coming into the house when it gets cold and singing in the corner of the, the hearth. This is a whole genre of poem in China, and that's what they're doing now. You can hear them, and next time you hear one, you'll think about this whole history, how many millions of years older they are than us. So thanks a lot. Thank you.